So, I think we're ready to start? Yeah, it looks pretty well. Okay, so please give a warm welcome applause for Leo and Björn. Um, so, hello everybody. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm Björn, that's Leo. And we're like a team working together for like... Maybe I come there. Oops. I think three to six years because we like study design together. So first we started um, to work as designers, and then at one point uh, we started to switch a little bit or to further it in a way or to add something on, and we started to do like free projects we call it or art projects if you want to call it. And uh, we take those to experiment and to further our like knowledge and make our like will to experiment grow. And I think one of the reasons why we, we got invited here was an exhibition we did about a question. And the question was, can we make fire with our bare hands? So it was about this make thing in the making fire which got us here, in a way. And, but we stay in line, in a way, because Leo and me, we always like try to work with questions. And at the moment, we're working like a catalog of questions consisting of 20. Um, one, for example, is how do we deal with, with fear? Um, another is like, is it really me that's looking at me in the mirror? And stuff like that. And today, we decided to make up a question for this talk and the question for this talk is what enables us to make and since we didn't want to show like of our work and since it's Christmas maybe we thought we make something for you so we made a little performance and that's what you're gonna see now. Thank you for all coming. An action can be described from two points of view. First, an action proceeds from a goal to a plan, to its execution, and to feedback being received. This is the action process. Second, an action is regulated by cognitions. The regulation processes can be conscious or automatic. This is the structure of action. Both points of view are combined in action theory. The action process consists of the following steps. A. Development of goals and decision between competing goals. B. Orientation, including prognosis of future events. C. Generation of plans. select a particular plan from available plans. E. Execution and monitoring of the plan. And F. The processing of feedback. Of course, actions are often quite chaotic. For example, goals may change in the middle of an execution. Moreover, later steps in the action process may change earlier ones. For example, a goal may be changed after one notices that the plan is not good. The figure presents a good first approximation. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> so this was something like a general introduction to like this making, which is like very close connected to action in a way and has a lot of um, common things with um, combining and redeveloping stuff and basically make, I'm not sure how many of you know this, but it comes from the act of a baker's man who is like working with the do and so it's always like building, rebuilding, destroying, building up again. And this is the first part of like eight we're going to show you. And the second part will be about the part of making, which is like giving yourself a sense in a way. I think if you work um, and you like what you do and you like what you make, it's really like giving you sense in a way. needs me at all, but I do need it. To just go off into the woods and make a piece of work roots me again. And if I don't work for a period of time, I feel, I do feel rootless. I don't, I don't know myself. Um, And it's, and it's very odd, if, I, if I've not worked for, say, two, three weeks, and then I give a lecture and talking about my work, and it feels like I'm talking about somebody else. <laughs> I do need to be on my own at times. I enjoy being by myself. thing we're gonna do is also connected with sense and the part of it, the part of making that you can ruin yourself or ruin um, the process of making if the questions get too big, the questions maybe after the sense of what you do or the use of what you do. It is only when facing multiple attributes, objectives, criteria, functions, etc., that we can talk about decision-making and its theory. As alternatives of choice become more complex and are characterized by multiple attributes, as well as multiple objectives, the problem of combining these various aspects into a single measure of utility becomes more difficult and less practical. Decision-making is a dynamic process. A complex search for information full of detours, enriched by feedback from casting about in all directions, gathering and discarding information, fueled by fluctuating uncertainty, indistinct 
and conflicting concepts, some sharp, some hazy. The process is an organic unity of both pre-decision and post-decision stages, overlapping with regions of partial decision-making. Man is a reluctant decision-maker, not a swiftly calculating machine. You should not infer from this characterization that decision-making has no structure or that no formalization of the process can be attempted. But surely it cannot be captured by a decision tree, by a decision table, by a single mathematical function or by other simple mechanistic artifacts. Its structure is functional, capable of generating its own path towards the decision. The final decision unfolds through a process of learning, understanding, information processing, assessing, and defining the problem and its circumstances. <coughs> the emphasis must be on the process, not the act or the outcome of making a decision. So the next part, the next important part for us, for our making, is the teamwork aspect, or like working in a group, working together. Uh, this is John Hersey with another Contagious Leadership Tip, and my tip today is that the Lone Ranger is alive and well, and it's 2010. And I say the Lone Ranger because, because of technology, many of us work alone. And I mean, we work by ourselves, for ourselves, with, us, our, with ourselves, you know, we never see another human being. And team, the, the, the notion of team has become less important, it seems. At least we give it less uh, importance. And the whole notion of team, together everyone achieves more, T-E-A-M, together everyone achieves more, is when we can combine with other folks. We, those other folks are multipliers to our expertise, and we're a multiplier to their expertise. And if we can come into a team environment with the intention of multiplying creativity, multiplying innovation, multiplying performance, imagine if all of our team members also came in with that same determination. Wow! Wouldn't things just burst wide open? Wouldn't we become more creative, more innovative, more excited, more energetic across the board? Together, everyone achieves more. You know, you don't have to be sitting across a table from someone to be part of a team. Most of the support people that we use in our business are all virtual, and they're from all over the world. And together, everyone achieves more is the motto that we use as contagious leaders in our business. And we're constantly looking for people who can contribute to that, who believe in making everybody better. You see it in sports. You hear us talk about people in sports all the time where they make the other teammates better. And that's what we do as contagious leaders to get... I hope you don't take this guy too serious, but we are very serious about our partnership, so... <laughs> the next um, part of our making um, is even more than like teamwork. It's like working in a network. And it's something like the sum is more than the addition of its parts.
the net is just um, the chance to get collective intelligence. Without uh, this interconnectivity, it's not possible to get this added value, this, uh, this over-summative thing that, that I say, it's more than the sum of the parts. This is only possible when we have connectivity. When you want to have um, something like collective intelligence, you need connectivity, high connectivity on the one connectivity on the one part, you need arousal in the system and you need valuation. And if these three things come together, if you have high connectivity, high arousal and a way to evaluate what you're doing, then you get this added value of collective intelligence. So it's not a matter of swarm intelligence or something. It's bringing people together in a connective situation, hoping that they are able to understand each other uh, enough to create something which is an <coughs> I am not small. So another very important part of our making process is the dealing with doubts. Hard enough, I cannot draw the idea was old. I do not have the right tools. The internet is too slow. My parents will not like it. I am freezing. I will die poor. She will think I am a pervert. But the climate change, it will not sell. I have no more time. This is not funny. I have no more gas. My hairs look weird today. I never do it the way. I am too weak. It is out of order. We have not the rights. My boss does not like it. I have no permission. It is too early. Way too slippery. Not today. I am not dressed well enough. The insurance does not cover. We have no budget. It is too cold. I have no good feeling. I have the wrong shorts. It is the wrong weather. It makes no sense. It is too expensive. I have the wrong socks. I feel not good right now. The water is too cold. sure how my hair will look now <laughs> so there's there are some doubts um, let me check the list <clears throat> yeah the seventh part which is very important for our making process 
is the matter of rhythm. Christmas. Was I three? Was I four? I don't remember. My parents gave me a drum kit and then that was it. Lost forever. Now no rush. Really with wait. of the brain, the pre-civilized human part of the brain, I mean almost maybe, whichever part is descended from the lizards, where rhythm is it. The first idea, I think probably the first communication was through rhythm, the four words. Uh, and I think when you get that as a you get that as a child, somehow you're connecting with your primal origins. But I know from that moment that was going to be my life. So, the last of the eight aspects of our making is the topic of staying in flow and using the energy resulting from that. And now you have a new challenge, and that challenge is just above your level of expertise or skill, you know, and you try to reach that, to develop your skill, to be able to play twinkle twinkle, okay? So you are now stretching your skill or expertise level to reach this new goal. You do that and you do it a couple times and you feel good. But now, again, you can do it too easy, too easy. It's no longer flow, it's kind of boring. So now you have to set a new set of uh, challenge to which you try to develop expertise to match. And of course, eventually, you know, after thousands and thousands of tries, you become a good piano player, you are a real expert, but that's kind of the, the learning curve in which flow keeps you always trying to up, up either your challenges or your skills. And that, in that sense, the, the, the motivation to experience flow is one of the main motives for learning anything, whether it's piano, history, uh, mathematics, you have it. If you can get kids started in that trajectory of getting back into the flow channel by either increasing skills or increasing challenges so that you can stay in that 
zone of optimal experience, then you got a kid who, or a person who is going to learn by herself because there's no, you know, it, it becomes a self increasing, a complexifying process that the person wants to continue in order to stay in flow. And the only way it can do that is by increasing one or the other. You could have saved all the applause for the end, but I'm very grateful for your applause in the meantime. Thank you very much for coming at this early time, and I hope you have a good day and a nice Christmas. Thank you very much. Thank you.